We've come to Genesis 25, the birth of Jacob and Esau, and we've noted the fact that God has already announced beforehand his choice of the younger Jacob over his older brother Esau. The blessing will reside on Jacob. The blessing will come through Jacob. Jacob will be a patriarch and a prince of Israel. As a matter of fact, Israel will get its name from Jacob. While Esau will make other kinds of choices and have another kind of heritage. Beginning in verse 27, we see a story from their childhood or their young manhood. Um, Esau was a man's man, and Jacob was not quite the athlete, not quite the hunter. Um, someone who was more domestic, someone who hung around the house or the tent more often than his brother. And as you might guess, Isaac loved Esau, Esau more than Jacob. I mean, after all, his son was a man's man, but also after all, his son would add to the family larder, would add to the family store of, of goods and provisions and, and food. I think it's a fairly common thing for a mother or father to like one child more than the other. I can honestly say that I love my three children equally. When we look in the scripture, the fact that um, fathers and mothers show favoritism to one child over the other, um, it usually leads to mischief and problems. We can argue, but the fact is God chose Jacob. Isn't that favoritism? The fact is God is perfect, and God can carry off the choice perfectly. But mothers and fathers are imperfect. And when they show favoritism to one child over another, there's usually jealousy and strife. That certainly happened in this family. Esau is out hunting and he stays so long that he doesn't eat and he goes way beyond the time when he could eat, when he should have eaten. And when he gets back, Jacob is cooking. And here are the two pictures of the brothers. Esau's hunting and Jacob is cooking. Esau's out in the field and Jacob is back in the kitchen. And when Esau comes in starving to death, he asks his brother to give him a little of the food that, he has, that he's prepared. And Jacob says in verse 31, first, sell me your birthright. In other words, Jacob is saying, since you were born first, you'll get twice as much of the property as I will when our father dies. I will trade you this meal today for your share of the property later. That's what he's telling him. And in verse 32, Esau reasons in this way. He says, what is my inheritance, what good will my inheritance do me if I'm dead? It's, it's much better to be alive and get half the inheritance than to be dead and get none of the inheritance. In other words, what he's saying is, I'm starving to death. I'm going to die unless I get something to eat. Now, that's the reasoning of a teenage boy, okay? Of course, he wouldn't have died. And of course, he makes a very terrible bargain. Now, we see something happening with Jacob, which is troubling. It's actually a terrible thing. We see it in chapter 25, and we're going to see it again in chapter 27. Should Jacob get the birthright? Yes. And Jacob will get the birthright. But Jacob doesn't want to wait on God. Jacob doesn't want to wait on getting the birthright in God's way. Jacob wants to do it himself. Remember yesterday I tell you what my friend taught me. Maybe it was the day before. You don't ever want to have anything that God doesn't give you. It's not enough to know that God wants you to have something. You also have to wait on the way God wants to give you something. 
the positive model of this is David. The negative model of this is Jacob. David knew that God had anointed him king. God knew that because Samuel had anointed him, uh, David knew that because Samuel had anointed him according to God's direction, that David was the true king and God's choice over Saul. But David would not exploit Saul's weakness. He would not ex exploit his mental weakness and emotional weakness. He would not exploit his spiritual weakness. He would not exploit the fact that he was asleep once while David stood over him with a sword. Even though it was God's will for David to have the crown, David would not take the crown from Saul under his own strength. He waited on God's timing. David is the positive model, at least in the case of Saul and the crown. Jacob is the negative model. Jacob already has the promise of God, and his mother knew it, and you can bet his mother told him. Why does he need the promise of Esau? But he exploits Esau's weakness. Now, there is an advantage in Esau selling his birthright. The advantage is that Esau can't blame God because Esau sold his birthright legally to his brother because it says in verse 33 that he swore. Jacob said, first swear to me, so he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Now, especially when we get to chapter 27 when Jacob tricks his father, we wonder, well, why can't he just take it back? I mean, in chapter 27, Jacob obtained the blessing from his father through fraudulent means. As a matter of fact, Isaac thought he was blessing Esau when he was really blessing Jacob. Well, we have no appreciation for how binding these verbal contracts were. Once you set it in the ancient Near East, it was like an, an ironclad, bulletproof, written legal contract in our day. It couldn't be broken. For Esau to say what he said to Jacob, for Isaac to say what he said to Jacob, it was like a contract which no lawyer could, could get around, no lawyer could find a hole in. We don't understand that today, but that was the situation then. Jacob said to Esau in verse 33, first swear to me. So he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob, which meant that even though Jacob was born second, now he has the rights sold to him by his brother of a firstborn. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. That is, Esau cared more about one meal than he cared about his inheritance. This is a carnal man. This is a man who makes poor choices. This is a man who would rather have short-term benefits than long-term benefits. There's a very uh, intelligent writer in the West. He's a Christian, but he doesn't write Christian books. He writes books for secular people, and his books usually have something to do with politics or economics. His name is George Gilder. George Gilder's father was killed during World War II. He was a pilot, and he was shot down and killed. And George Gilder's father was a roommate at Harvard to David Rockefeller of the famous rich oil family in America. So David Rockefeller adopted George Gilder as a tribute to his dead roommate who died in World War II. George Gilder wrote a book called Wealth and Poverty. George Gilder's an evangelical Christian, but he doesn't write books for Christians. And in the book Wealth and Poverty, he says the key to building wealth is to postpone your pleasure. Put off your pleasure. Don't take your pleasure now. Save it until later. He said that's the key to building wealth. That's the thesis of the book. That's also a wonderful spiritual lesson. Put off your pleasure. 
postpone your pleasure. That's a lesson that Esau never learned. Esau wanted his pleasure today. He wanted the meal in front of him. He wanted that meal right now so that he despised his birthright, and he lost his birthright. He lost the right of the firstborn for one bowl of stew, for one bowl of borscht. He gave it all up. It's amazing. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com.